Okay, great. So thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to talk about the classification of topological band structures with crystal symmetry. Um, so band structures means, of course, it's a non-interacting problem. And since many people here are interested in interacting topological phases and fractionalization, I wanted to give two motivations for working on this problem, um, which I won't return to. Uh, but just to kind of motivate it. Um, so the first motivation is that many materials are well described by band structures. So if we want to build devices which are made from materials, we need to understand um, topological band structures and also their surface states. And then the second motivation is that uh, maybe the framework for understanding uh, non-interacting uh, fermionic systems with crystal symmetry will give us some, some useful framework or a stepping stone to the interacting case. So that's some of the motivation. Um, the second preliminary is that the work I'm describing has been really collaborative, so I want to acknowledge some really nice collaborators. And then finally, um, onto the talk. Okay, so I don't need to uh, I don't need to say much about this table. Ashwin already showed it, and part of it was drawn on the board yesterday. But the point is that. Um, Topological insulators with internal symmetries are really well understood um, and completely classified uh, at this point. And even if we have translation symmetry, we know that some of these classes are um, enhanced by getting weak topological indices. But the question is, what happens if we have crystal symmetry? Now, um, there's kind of previously the classification of topological insulators with crystal symmetry has been somewhat piecewise. So um, what I mean by that is people have considered a particular symmetry, a particular set of symmetries, and then classified the topological phases, but it's, there's been no unifying principle. So for example, um, Liang Fu introduced this topological crystalline insulator uh, in 2011. Um, this is protected by a combination of time reversal and C4 symmetry. And actually prior to that, Tio, Fu, and Kane um, introduced the mirror churn insulator, which is protected by mirror symmetry. Each of these, the first is, um, has a Z2 classification, the latter has a Z classification. And down here, um, I listed some more recent uh, topological crystalline insulators protected by combinations of non-somorphic symmetries. But there's no unifying principle to understand, well, you know, if I have these symmetries or these symmetries, how are their classifications um, related to each other? And I want to emphasize that this isn't due to a lack of classification of symmetries. So for people who haven't been thinking about this, maybe you've forgotten, um, the classification of crystal symmetries in 3D is completely well understood, textbook level information. So um, in 3D, there's 230 possible space groups. These tell us all the different types of crystal symmetries that we can have. So that classification we have in place. The question is, how do we, um, how do we classify the band structures once, once we're within one of these 230 space groups? And so the questions that I want to um, address in this talk are, well, first of all, this is the, the main part of the talk. Um, if you give me some band structure and you say, well, here's some group of valence bands, uh, how do I know if those bands are topological bands? How can I identify them um, in a particular space group? And then the second question, which I'll just very briefly touch on, is um, how, can we, how can we use this information to predict materials? And so this is actually the kind of the very interesting question because so far all of these phases are classified by some very abstract Z, Z2, Z4 index, but the periodic table isn't labeled in this way. We can't, you know, we can't elegantly find materials which have these indices. And so this is a challenging um, and interesting problem that we, that we tried to address, but I won't say a ton about. Okay, so then I need to um, define what do I mean by a topological band structure. So, so Eslam gave some nice um, introduction to this in the morning. What I mean is that basically I want two band structures or two groups of valence bands to be considered equivalent to each other if I can deform one of them to, each other, to the other one uh, without closing the gap and while preserving crystal symmetries. But I can also say I want to call something trivial if for those same valence bands, I can smoothly deform them to be the valence bands of a Hamiltonian which has no K dependence. And so it's just a Hamiltonian which has a bunch of isolated sites, um, and those sites kind of are not talking to each other at all. So formally, people say um, that, the, that for the uh, trivial phases, which I'll call an atomic limit, 
that they have um, localized Vanier functions. But this is just a way of saying that you can understand a group of localized functions um, that obey all the symmetries uh, for these bands. Um, but I can also think of that as if I tried to pull the atoms apart so that they didn't talk to each other and they were far away from each other, um, could I do such a thing while leaving the gap open and preserving the crystal symmetry? And then the topological phases won't have this feature. And the reason I drew this picture is to say you can have two band structures that look exactly the same as each other, um, but one of them could be a topological insulator, one could be an atomic insulator. Maybe you see this by the presence of surface states. Um, the point is, it's not enough to just look at the band structure, you need to look at the Hamiltonian itself. And probably everyone, um, everyone here is probably familiar with this. So the strategy that I want to take is that instead of classifying the topological phases, what we want to do is find a way to understand the trivial or the atomic limit phases. So we're going to enumerate all the atomic limit phases. And basically, for each atomic limit, uh, we're going to give it a key. That key is going to be a combination of symmetry eigenvalues at high symmetry points. Um, then we're going to do this. We're going to have a way to make every single atomic limit, to make a list of these things. So then what we can do is if you now give me some band structure, you say, are the valence bands topological? I can look at the symmetry eigenvalues at the high symmetry points compared to my list of atomic limits, and therefore I can say these bands, don't, their symmetry eigenvalues don't match any of the atomic limits, therefore we can be sure that these bands aren't deformable to any atomic limit, therefore we'll call them topological. So that's what the main idea is. And so this is, um, this is kind of the main paper that I'm talking about, which is the title of this talk, which is called Topological Quantum Chemistry. Um, but I want to emphasize that the same, the same general principle is also the kind of underlying principle in this paper of uh, Adrian, Ashvin, and Hirky Watanabe. Um, so I will talk about my own train of thought, but these papers kind of came out in parallel and I think are based on a similar set of ideas. So then we reach this question of how can we identify all atomic limits? So a space group isn't enough to specify an atomic limit. Um, one reason is because if you have a given set of symmetry, you can still arrange atoms in different ways uh, and obey that symmetry. So for example, if you have um, the symmetry of the honeycomb lattice, which is like a six-fold rotation and some mirror symmetries, um, one thing that you can do is you can draw a triangular lattice. This also has this symmetry. And the difference between, um, between these three pictures, which all have a six-fold rotation and two mirror symmetries, is what are the symmetries that leave one single site fixed? So for example, on the triangular lattice, if you just look at, you know, if you just look at one site, each site is invariant under the six-fold rotation and also both of the mirrors. In contrast, if you look at the honeycomb lattice and you just fix looking at one site, you'll see that each site is only invariant under a threefold rotation. The sixfold rotations mix the A and the B sites of the sub lattice. And similarly, on the Kagome lattice, each site is only invariant under a twofold rotation, and the sixfolds will mix the three sites in the unit cell. So, in order to specify one of these atomic limits, we need to specify the space group, but we also need to specify how are the atoms arranged. And each of these different arrangements is called a wick off position. The second um, information, the second piece of information that we need to identify an atomic limit phase is on each particular site, um, what's the orbital? Basically, what's the degree of freedom? So for example, if we pick the honeycomb lattice, um, we can make two different configurations of, of orbitals. So this is to say, every atom, of course, has every single orbital, but usually there will only be some subset of orbitals which are near the Fermi level. And so we only, when we specify an atomic limit, we're just going to talk about one of those orbitals with the understanding that each atom will actually contain all of these. Um, and so if we have this honeycomb lattice, we can say, well, we have either s orbitals or pz orbitals on the honeycomb lattice. They actually have the same symmetry under these um, honeycomb symmetries. Or we can talk about mixing px and py orbitals. These degrees of freedom, which are the space group, the wick off position, and the orbital, these are the things that define, that's what we're going to take to be the data that defines the atomic limit. Um, and importantly, this data completely specifies the symmetry of the band structure. So, um, so how can I understand that? The, the heuristic idea is that if you give me the lattice and the orbital, and we have that data on just one single site, 
then I can act with, um, with any other symmetry in the space group and get to any other site. So for example, if I'm on the honeycomb lattice, I say uh, I have an S orbital at one corner of a honeycomb lattice. Then I do a six-fold rotation about the center, and that tells me, oh, I need to have an S orbital at this other corner of the honeycomb lattice. And then, of course, I translate, and I get the entire honeycomb lattice filled with S orbitals. But I could do the same thing with any other orbital, like the PX and PY orbitals, and then the six-fold rotation would rotate them around in a particular way. So if I have this information on just one site, then I know how the symmetries will act on the entire lattice. And formally, this can be considered um, an example of, uh, of in inducing a representation. So basically, when I'm saying orbital, what I'm really meaning is this is a representation of the group of symmetries that leaves that site invariant. So there's some finite group, it's a point group, that leaves one site invariant. Orbital has to transform under that group, so it's a representation. The space group is a supergroup of that small point group, and so I can take my representation on one site and induce it and get a representation of the entire space group. That's, that's the formal way to say it, but heuristically it just means if you tell me the symmetry on one site in the lattice, I kind of know how to, how to tile the entire lattice. Um, I can then Fourier transform this data, and this gives me a representation at each point in K space. And so in a band structure, at each K point, there are symmetries that leave the K point invariant, and you label bands at that k-point by irreps of the group that leaves that k-point invariant. So if I have this representation, what I can then do is reduce to a representation of the symmetries called the little group at k that leaves this k-point invariant, and that will tell me what these labels are at k. So if I know just this data um, about the arrangement of atoms and the orbital content in my particular space group, then I automatically get all of these labels out in the entire Bruin zone. I don't know how they're ordered in energy, so I'm kind of drawing this to be part of a band structure, but actually what I've said so far doesn't have a Hamiltonian, it doesn't even have energy. It's really just a set of flat bands which transform in some way. And the point is that I know all their labels. And um, the other important thing to say is that this is coming out of um, a series of papers by Zach, the same Zach as the Zach phase, uh, from the 1980s. And he called this idea um, a band representation because this is forming a representation of the entire band. So usually, many times people talk about a representation at one particular point and they make um, a K dot P Hamiltonian. Instead, what we're talking about is all the representations at every single K point all at one time. And Zach was really interested in this idea because he wanted to be able to connect different K dot P representations at different points in the Brewitt zone. And that's exactly what this setup um, is designed to do. Okay, so um, to be kind of more concrete about it, uh, I just wanted to show if we have, for example, PZ orbitals on the honeycomb lattice, then I can determine at each K point which of these labels will appear. And one of the immediate consequences of this is to say um, we get this Dirac point in graphene. And this isn't specific to the Hamiltonian of graphene. We can have many different parameters. We could write a different Hamiltonian. You can't avoid having this Dirac point. So just having this symmetry information um, can be pretty powerful. And similarly, I wrote S or PZ orbitals, again, because S orbitals have the same symmetry. So if we had a material like graphene where the S orbitals were near the Fermi level, um, we would also get out a band structure that looks identical to this. Maybe the scales are different, the bands curve in a different way, but you can't avoid this point. In contrast, if we then had, um, if we compare this to PX and PY orbitals, we get some different structure where we also have this Dirac point, but then we have some other one-fold um, or single, singly degenerate bands. And in that case, then we're not necessarily required to have this point um, at half fill. Okay, so, so that's how we want to define an atomic limit. Um, then the next question is, we want to enumerate all of these atomic limits. Because remember, what we're trying to do is make some list of all the atomic limit phases so that we can identify topological phases as being the complement of this. But the problem is that there's infinitely many of these. So for example, I have my S orbitals on the honeycomb lattice. They give me a set of labels. But I could consider also having some PX and PY orbitals at the center of the honeycomb lattice. They give me some more labels. And I can keep going like this. And each one of these is going to give me an atomic limit phase. So, um, so this seems to be a problem to our idea of trying to enumerate all atomic limits. The way to overcome this problem is to realize that, Ms. Zach also realized this, that there's, um, that there's a finite subset of these 
uh, which are called the elementary band representations, from which all the other band representations decompose. And so you can kind of think of these like EREPs. Um, formally, they're not EREPs, but we can think of it this way. Every, every one of these atomic limit phases gives us a representation, and they all decompose into these elementary band representations. Um, the elementary band representations are defined by being those that can't be further decomposed. And so, um, so there's a finite number of these. Why? Because we can make some necessary conditions um, to be elementary. So one of the conditions is that this EREP that we're choosing, uh, the, well, the representation that we're choosing, which I called orbital, um, this has to be an EREP. So this kind of makes sense because um, any representation of that site symmetry group that left the single site invariant can be decomposed into EREP. So we only need to consider EREPs of a single site. And in addition, um, I drew all these different configurations of atoms but we only need to consider configurations that are maximally symmetric because it happens that if you consider a configuration which is, um, which is less symmetric, so by which it means it has a, a, a neighbor of more symmetry, um, then you'll see that the representation that you induce uh, will, will be decomposed into representations coming from the higher symmetry points. And so these conditions together tell us that there's only a finite number of elementary band representations um, that we need to consider. So all of our atomic limit phases can be obtained by adding together these elementary band representations, and there's finitely many of them. Um, that finite number is actually quite large. When we consider um, time reversal, no time reversal, spin orbit, no spin orbit, the number turns out to be around 10,000. So it's a large number. It's a problem that we need a computer for, but it's, it's still definitely a finite number. So, um, so one of the outcomes of, um, of our work is that we uploaded um, on the, so there's a website called the Bilbao Crystal Graphic Server. Probably a lot of people here are not using such uh, mundane tools. Um, I, I'm kidding, because this is a very useful, this is an extremely useful website, and anyone who's thinking about crystal <laughs> symmetry, I would encourage you to look at this website. It lists all the space group, it lists all the generators, it has lots and lots of information. Um, Anyway, so we added an application to this website, which is called BandRep. And so basically, you get a screen like this, you can enter a space group, and what happens when you enter the space group is you get a very large table. And the table is, is classified or is understood as follows. So the, the first row tells me how are the atoms arranged. So this is basically a code. I said earlier we can understand these atomic um, arrangements by what's the symmetry group that leaves one point invariant. So that's some group, and that's what this group is indicating. So this first row is saying, how are the atoms arranged? The second row is saying, um, this will end up being an ear up of this group. What's the orbital content? And then, like I said, that information uniquely, not uniquely, but completely <coughs> determines the symmetry labels um, at any k point, but in particular, the high symmetry k points. And so this is a set of labels which will appear at, um, in the brain zone corresponding to that particular atomic limit. So now these are all tabulated. People can look them up, um, which I think is useful for lots of purposes besides understanding topological phases. So this comes back to the first point that I was mentioning, which is um, if you have a band structure and then you want to know are your valence bands topological, one thing that you can do then is say compute all these symmetry labels at high symmetry points and compare them to the lists which we have on the Bilbao crystallographic server. If your labels aren't a sum of the labels that appear on the server, you know that there's no way to smoothly deform your bands to some atomic limit um, because such a smooth deformation can't change the symmetry labels because we want to keep the gap open. So this accomplishes um, our first goal. Now, there's some subtleties in here, which um, luckily I don't have time to discuss, um, but the subtleties are basically, you know, you can have topological phases without crystal symmetry, obviously. We know this. You can have a churn insulator without any symmetry at all. So we can't identify all topological phases um, in this way, and there's even some more subtle examples of this. Um, and, and a corollary to that is that you might have two different um, you might have two different sets of bands which have all the same symmetry labels but still differ by some non-trivial topological index. So this isn't really a complete, um, a complete way to diagnose all topological phases, but it does give us some kind of unifying principle. Okay, and then the, the last point is, um, so I said that there's some, some route that we can find topological material. So, so how does this work? Um, so the idea is that for these elementary band representations, they're kind of the minimal units which obey crystal symmetry. 
Therefore, if you have such a group of bands and they are realized with some energy gap, like I've drawn schematically here, then you know that this upper and lower group of bands can't by themselves separately realize, um, realize the spatial symmetries in a trivial way. Otherwise, this elementary um, band representation would decompose into two other band representations. And by definition, we define that not to be the case. So how does this help us um, try to find topological materials? The idea would be, could we find all the elementary band representations which can realize an energy gap like this? Then materials which have those orbital content related to the elementary band representation near the Fermi level, um, and also which are insulating, those are the places where we could look to realize, um, to, find topological, to find topological bands. And so we found a couple of examples of this. Um, there's kind of some places are more useful to look than others. So we found some examples of this, and our original paper has some, um, has some examples of materials found in this way. Now this idea has led to a kind of um, a plethora of interesting papers. So I listed a, a few of them here. Um, in particular, this idea of fragile TIs, which as Lam was mentioning earlier, um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff that came out of this, and maybe I can't mention it all right now. Um, so anyway, we thought it was a good idea to try to find materials um, in this way. And we had some small success with this. Um, OK, so this gives us a predictive tool for topological material search. But I want to also mention that then what came out of this a couple of years later is um, some comprehensive websites. So there's actually two such websites, and I put the references here. And basically what these websites are doing is they took all the materials from the ICSD, which is the Crystal Structure Database, computed all the band structures, and then looked at all their labels at high symmetry points and compared them to the trivial atomic limit labels. Um, and then... Um, and then therefore, for every single material which is uploaded onto this database, they find a way to understand its topological, whether it's topological insulator or not. And so, um, so, so this is just one example um, of this. So now, this is actually kind of a complete answer for all known, um, for all known materials which are in this database. You can look them up here on one of these websites and figure out what their, um, what their topological indices are. Okay, good. So, um, so this is a summary. So this is a summary of the points that I made in this talk. And then I just wanted to give some advertisements um, on the bottom. Uh, here's some projects which I'm working on kind of currently. And so, so I'll be here for the next uh, day and a half or so. So if any of this is interesting to people, then, um, then it would be great to discuss more. So thank you for your attention. Questions? It's, uh, it's easy to check that the topological bands are not some of these elementary <coughs> band representations in which you list in the table, like because there are a finite number of them. And then for any band, you can just check whether it's a sum or not. Yeah, so what's easy to check is if you have the labels at high symmetry points, you know, does it, does it correspond to some of the elementary band representations? That that's, can be done, you know, with an algorithm. Um, the... The challenging part, which is not included in these materials databases and I don't think is comprehensively understood, is um, that not every single topological phase is going to be labeled by its, um, by its symmetry indices. And even if you have something like a mirror churn insulator, for example, the mirror eigen, there's only one, if you have time reversal symmetry, all mirror eigenvalues will come in plus or minus i pairs. So even in that case where you definitely have a phase which is predicted by crystal symmetry, you still can't use the ear to identify that phase. So there seems to be some set of phases which are identifiable in this way and some other set usually related to churn number which is not identifiable in this way. So well, there's also a classification in terms of K-theory, equivariant K-theory, which maybe relates to some of those representations. Yeah. So, right. It would be, I'm not, hopefully these things will mesh with each other. Oh, so there's one important difference, which is, um, I'm not sure if, uh, if you caught this in the morning. So what Eslam was mentioning is, what some of this work has exposed is the difference between fragile and stable topological phases. Now, my understanding of the K-theory classification, although uh, I'm not an expert on it, 
this, the K theory classification will always give you a stable classification. What we came to through this definition is that sometimes there's groups of bands which have now been dubbed fragile uh, in some work by Ashwin and company, um, which is a set of bands which has no Vanier representation, but for which you can add other trivial bands and get a Vanier representation. So these things would not be accessible through the K-theory classification, and it's a matter partially of semantics, but partially not of which of these you want to, which are interesting to you. It's semantics whether you call them topological. It's not semantics as to whether they have edge states or other observable consequences. So that's one place where these things will not agree with each other. Yeah. Maybe one thing I could add to that is given some of the elementary band representations in this language which are considered trivial, would be considered non trivial in shape theory. So there are some cases when people have discounted from K theory and tried to match it to band theory. And literally all the different symmetry assignments for the bands are uh, counted as different phases in K theory. So taking the K theory and interpreting it in terms of the band structure is already non trivial. So just the K3 is not the answer in this case. Depends what the question is. Yeah. yeah. Depends what the question is. Yeah. Yeah. Follow up on your previous answer. So you understand correctly that in the federal case, there's no reason to expect uh, Gabriel set mode. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, 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 what Eslam was saying this morning is that there can be signatures at defects. So there can be some physical signatures. Um, you wouldn't expect some anomalous surface state. One thing I'm not sure of is, could you have some non-anomalous non surface state, which, say, would be canceled if you added the right trivial phase? But it's basically like index theory doesn't predict any trivial yeah. states. Yeah, yeah. There it is, by accident. Yeah. No. You weren't saying they were there by accident. Right, I'm... But they, so, they have to be there, but they're not... It's a question. It's not a statement. Yeah, it, it's an interesting <laughs> speculation on my part, which would be, suppose that you excluded exactly the right trivial bands which would give you the um which would kind of trivialize everything suppose that you excluded those would it still be possible that you could have surface states they would not be anomalous surface states but the, potentially they could be required if you have this restricted space that's what my i have no evidence that this could be the case i just haven't seen it ruled out yeah uh, the comment is not true but it's like okay, there are in they just look like you they, they might be identified as quote unquote homogeneous in K theory, but they are in K theory. Yeah. They are distinct phases in K theory. It's not that they're not in K theory. Can you just repeat it? These fragile phases, they are, in, they are in fact in K theory. It's just a question of what the court trivial versus not trivial, yeah. but they do exist as part of the K theory classification, so there's no problem there. Well, I thought they would be modded out, basically. Yeah. No, they, well, it depends how you define the equivalent, but there is a sense of K theory there. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, let's thank Janet and move on to the next talk.